Hi, Alex Austin. Hi, should Danny we, O'Dwyer. Should we, should we talk about publishers? Yeah. Aren't they that's, great? That's fun. <laughs> Fuck. They say to understand somebody, you have to walk a mile in their shoes. So last year, in an attempt to understand an area of games development I knew nothing about, I decided to do exactly that. Last year, I tried to pitch our game Stunt Derby to publishers, and after about 12 months of some of the most frustrating and bemusing professional interactions of my entire life, I'm here to tell you all about it, and let you know if we managed to get Stunt Derby signed. So today we're going to talk about who it is in games who has all the money, how you pitch to those people to get that money, and why 2023 was the worst year in living memory to try and get some of that money. That was until 2024, and why that's kind of going to be a big problem. Here comes the... <laughs> 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 so about a year ago I set out to get funding for our game Stunt Derby. Up until this point it's been a one-man show with Alex working on the game and me supporting him in as best as way I can, doing ancillary work like promoting the game, managing the Steam page, and doing business admin. Last year I stepped into a new role, Getter of Money. You see, you can't make a game without cash, and while I've been paying Alex some money out of my own pocket to make sure he can pay the occasional rent bill without having to burn hours doing corporate work, I don't have enough to pay him full time, or say, for an artist, to make it look less like programmer art while still retaining the retro aesthetic. So to get this funding, I would have to pitch some money havers. And to my surprise, much like a high school sociology report, asking people to give you hundreds of thousands of dollars is done using Microsoft Power. PowerPoint. Okay, so right now there are two main players in the world of video game funding. There are publishers and there are venture capital firms. Publishers you've probably heard of. There are big ones like Tencent and Epic. Uh, there are smaller ones like Devolver and Annapurna. And then they go all the way down to single person operations you've probably never heard of. Uh, publishers tend to be more experienced in the world of video games development and marketing. They understand what it takes to make a game. They have the email address of whoever runs Microsoft's Game Pass. They, they know how Steam works. Generally, they're, to, they're there to help, uh, to get involved as much as they can. And uh, for that, you pay a premium. You have to give them a percentage cut of every game that's sold. In the past, these were pretty terrible deals, especially back in the world of it was hard to get on consoles and brick and mortar shops. You needed to make boxes and all that sort of stuff. Sometimes developers would get like 20, 30% of the actual uh, revenue from any game that was sold. Um, in recent years, it had been getting better. You had a lot of indie publishers coming into the space offering these 70-30 splits where the developer got 70%. Uh, and often the recoup wasn't as bad. Recoup is basically you know, hey, look, we'll give you a million dollars and we'll split it, you know, 70, 70, 30, but not until we have recouped all of our initial investment. So that means that you don't see a lick of it, the developer doesn't, until all of that initial million has been made back for the publisher. And oftentimes there were 2x recoup or 3x recoup, meaning that if they put a million into a game, they wanted to see 3 million back before you saw any of it. That stuff for the lar longest time seem to have been sort of going away, but in recent years, those percentages have gotten a little bit stingier. Now even some of the cooler indie publishers are looking for 50-50 splits. Um, on the other side of the table, you have uh, venture capital firms, or VCs as we'll call them for the rest of this. VCs have operated in you know, tech for years, uh, you know, doing a lot of investing in these small tech companies to try and hopefully be the biggest new thing. They go public, they IPO, they make the initial investors shitloads of money. Games is kind of a weird fit for this because we're an entertainment industry, but for the past couple of years, VCs have looked at gaming as this sort of new green pasture to try and make these end roads into. Uh, in the past few years, VCs have been investing in big studios, small studios, all that type of thing, but they generally don't have the industry experience of publishers. Maybe that's a good thing, maybe that's a bad thing, maybe they're less involved in the day-to-day. -day. It, it all depends on what you want. Uh, one thing to make sure with VCs that you're aware of, though, is that oftentimes they are investing in the company, not the game. So while you might have some weirdness with a publisher who may want to own the rights to the IP, again, something that kind of used to happen in the past, but maybe is creeping back in again. On the VC side, oftentimes they will own the company, which means that it's not so much of an issue of them like canceling a deal, more of an issue that they could fire you from the company that you started because they're you know, the biggest investor in it. Uh, so both sides have positives and negatives depending on kind of how much money you want, how much help you need as well. And for us, we didn't want to go down the VC route and also we didn't want to go down the route of some publishers who just wanted to give us 
cash and then kind of let us on our merry way. We kind of wanted somebody who was a bit more involved, maybe a developer who was a publisher as well, uh, because Alex is working on his own. And honestly, the more people and ideas we can get in the room as early as possible, uh, the better for us. The, the more support, basically, the better. For any pitch, you need a deck, basically a Google Sheets presentation that tells the publisher or investor everything they need to know. What the game is, how much money you're looking for, what you're going to spend it on, what your team looks like, all that sort of stuff. And thankfully, there are loads of resources online to help you build one, from YouTube tutorials to successful pitches from other studios that they've simply uploaded to YouTube. Once I'd built my first version of the pitch deck, I needed somebody to vet it, give me some idea of where I'm going right and where I'm going wrong. So I reached out to Nick Sutner. You may remember him from EG or 1UP back in the day, but he spent most of the past decade helping to sign games at various places. He's also a developer and his team just announced their new game Arranger, a role-puzzling adventure. You can wishlist it over on Steam if it catches your eye. See, we're all pitching. You know, ideally it's like 10 pages and then if people, you can, you know, you can have things like if you want a more detailed budget, go here, a more detailed timeline, go here, or like to be provided upon request, kind of like a resume. But I think keeping it like 10 to 20 is like the most. I think if it's over that, if it's over that, it makes me feel like maybe you haven't quite figured out what the heart of your game is. All right, so here's the front page of this deck, uh, which immediately has over here a video version of the deck here, where I'll, I'll probably play this after I show you guys this, which is basically just like, you know, hey, if you want to just watch a quick I guess it's seven minutes. I didn't think it was seven minutes long. Maybe I'll put a clip of it in here and you can, I'll put a link in the description if you want to see more of it. I think when you're pitching, it's kind of a three-stage process where the, and it, it kind of goes with like, again, getting getting a person excited at a publisher or platform or whatever. The first thing they think is like, am I excited about this personally? Does this game speak to me? Do I want to play it? I think rarely are people really, they're sort of like, what does my employer want to sign? I think it, it's important that they get excited about it personally too. So I think that's the first thing is like, can you get the person you're talking to excited about the game? Uh, if not, it's like a non-starter, but hopefully so. So next page is a pretty easy, you know, what is this game? What other games do we think it kind of looks like or combines? The next one is just saying like, the dry, you know, the physics feel really good. Half the joy of this game is the fact that it controls ver the fidelity is super high. It doesn't feel like arcadey. It doesn't hold your hand. It might be a bit weird at the start, but you get used to it. Tracks are nuts. Multiplayer. Um, and these GIFs is something that came across a lot. If you have motion in your... If it's static, all these pages, it doesn't sort of, you know... Games move and games are fun because of the motion and movement. So, um, you know, the, the, car, the cars don't look this crappy anymore. <laughs> but I, so I was doing a lot of, like, annoying production work to get these GIFs really good. But, um... You know, uh, once every time Alex would update the game, I'd have to go back and do a bunch more. All right, let's pause that for a second because I want to talk about the elephant in the room. And this is something that people were uh, saying in the comments and something I wanted to talk about for a while, but I didn't really have a good spot until now. This is like the perfect time to talk about it. People know Noclip, uh, and a lot of people know who I am as well. And that's going to make a difference. If I'm out there pitching a game, if I'm looking for wish lists, if I'm trying to get money from a publisher or at least trying to get them to look at a fucking PowerPoint for like two minutes, right? It's going to be easier for me to do that than it is somebody else. And that's obviously an important thing to consider with this whole stunt derby experiment, right? This whole thing was started to try and like, basically give me an excuse and a, like a Trojan horse to try and understand areas of development that I just don't, you just don't understand them unless you try them yourself. Um, it has turned into a game and a project that I'm like, I really love and Alex is really loves working on. Um, and that has changed some of the communication around it, but at the very least, when we're trying to open doors with publishers, which is arguably the hardest part of uh, pitching somebody, is trying to just get them to open the email or respond to an email or get the initial first meeting, it's definitely been easier for us than it would be for somebody else. And then if they're into the game, the second question I think they should be asking themselves is can this team pull off the thing they're pitching me? That's like the critical second step. And I think both of those are important because if they can't, it doesn't matter if they like it. And if they don't like it, you're gonna not get to that second step anyways. This was based on some feedback that I had a lot of people asking us, what do we think you, what, what do you wanna do with the multiplayer? Um, we had some people who were like saying, oh, you guys should do like games as a service type thing or have seasons, which I think is why this one is in here. There was some degree of tweaking the decks for different people. I'll, I'll admit, I'll say it. And then 
if they like the game, if they think the team can pull it off, then the third thing is like, can the organization I'm representing in this pitch afford to take this risk on it? And then that that's a right. bunch of other questions. And that is, you know, sometimes it's kind of out of your hands at some point and lots of financial forecasting or whatever. But I think those two pieces are really important. So even if it's a killer idea, and sometimes it's like too killer, you're like, oh, this is like, sounds great, but this reasonably is not a thing someone can make, especially on like a, you know, a couple year timeline or whatever. So, so that, that's some things we can return to here. But I think that's that's the biggest thing for me is that I think like the timeline feels ambitious and you're not asking for enough money. The 200,000 we were asking for was based on this budget, but also based on what you ask for. Because you could ask for like 40,000, which would probably get us a lot of the way there. We'd have to figure out the art wouldn't be much better. Um, the sound wouldn't be much better and we'd you know, it wouldn't be the type of game that a publisher would want to invest in, but it, it might be enough to get to early access, to get to like a, a client we could release for that. And I see a lot of ducks that people actually, like if they go sort of the full mile, they're like, here is our like conservative, realistic and optimistic sales forecasts for our own game. And like right. a lot of times I think I just sort of like, I'm like, uh, whether this is real realistic or not, doesn't really matter to me so much. It's like, that's that's kind of a shot in the dark. However, and it shows me that you're being really thoughtful about this and you're right. being optimistic about it. So I appreciate seeing that in there too. Um, I'm not saying you need to do that, but you, it's one thing you need to think about. And then, yeah, it was, it was to also highlight like how we got here, like, you know, what the, the, the vibe of this development has always been super transparent. Like from fucking day zero, this game was playable and we were doing community play tests. And it was just showing like, look, this is how the game progressed over those months. Say, hey, grab a key, join the next play test. Boom, easy, email me, come play the game. And that was the deck. People liked the deck, but they didn't fucking like it enough. Once I had the deck, it was time to fire it around. I built an Excel spreadsheet of publishers I thought would work well with us and started pounding the internet pavement. I emailed well over 100 people over the course of these months, many of which replied and some of whom conducted remote meetings with us. So here's what I learned about talking to publishers. It's largely indistinguishable from online dating. There's a superficial element for sure, an initial attraction to the art or genre, but you basically go on date after date, some remote, others in person, and slowly over weeks and months, you decide whether or not you're gonna move in with each other or not. It also has the same problems as dating, being that sometimes people just stop texting back or they just tell you that it's not gonna work. That's actually preferred because then you can stop wasting time trying to contact them. But unlike dating, the asymmetrical nature of this relationship is ever present, especially the closer you get to signing a contract. So in a second, you're gonna see myself and Alex talking about everything, about trying to get deals done, about deals that fell through and all that sort of stuff. But first I wanna do a quick bit of table setting. First of all, about what 2023 was like. And then secondly, about the deals uh, that I thought I had and then didn't have. Uh, so 2023 was sort of the canary in the coal mine for the current situation uh, or lack of money or lack of investment or lack of confidence maybe in gaming at the moment. Last year, I was talking to a lot of fellow indie devs, I guess I can say in this context, and they were saying a lot of the same things, which was that VCs in the past, you could show them a PowerPoint and hey, if you used to work at Riot, <laughs> then you probably got some money. <laughs> Um, up until last year, that kind of was the case. And then last year, they started to want to see demos. They wanted to see the game running. They wanted to have some sort of proof of concept, which honestly is like due diligence. That's what the publishers were doing too. But on the publisher side, a lot of the publishers either had slates that were full because stuff got sort of knocked down the road due to COVID, or they were just not packing their deck like they used to. Like indie games, there's a lot of really good indie games out there at the moment. And I really do think that because there's this, this abundance of, of games out there that are, and the quality has gotten so much better, that fewer games are selling, or maybe like it's a bit more of a struggle than it used to be. Maybe the budgets have gone up too, I'm not quite sure, but for whatever reason, the indie publishers were also kind of holding back a little bit on, on giving out money. And that just continued throughout the entire year. I recently came back from uh, DICE in Las Vegas, which is the big industry summit, and there were a lot of desperate people basically trying to get deals struck. 
and a lot of publishers and VCs who are basically saying, we're not spending anything right now, talk to us in three or four months maybe, and uh, we'll see about then. So right now it seems like, as bad as last year was, this year seems like almost, not impossible, but there's going to be a lot of people going to GDC in the next couple of weeks, really trying to make sure that they stick, uh, get, get, get pen to paper on some sort of deal. And it's, it's wild. We'll talk about it a bit in a second, but it's, it's made me think like, what happens then? Because there are games out there, like ours, that don't need that much of an injection of capital to make them real. Um, so in, in years past, you had stuff like Kickstarter, but Kickstarter seems to have kind of gone out of fashion because of, you know, a bunch of projects that didn't really work out. And I, I guess it just, be, it kind of became a lazy place to try and get some quick money to throw something together that then you'd eventually just go to a publisher anyway and and, and try and get more money for it. Um, so we're just in a weird place right now. And I'm not really sure where the right option is for folks to get, uh, to get funding. Uh, secondly, and we'll talk about it a little bit in a second, um, we had two different publishers that were basically ready to sign us. One of them twice. And we were a really good fit with that one. But there's something about the asymmetrical nature of communications in this stuff that I just find absolutely poisonous. And I, I had heard this talking to developers who have pitched their games. It's like a soul-crushing endeavor. You know, I'm a competent person, I think. I, I'm a pretty like shrewd negotiator, I feel. I've been an independent freelancer uh, for most of my career, except for the five or so years I worked at GameSpot. Either side of that, I, I ran my own companies and did my own thing. Um, and I'm used to doing deals and I'm used to, uh, you know, talking to people and compromising. And I have never in my life experienced such a one-sided power uh, in communication as I have with this whole process. Um, people just not responding to fucking emails or ghosting you. We had one publisher who was completely down to do it, seemed super enthusiastic, and then just stopped replying to emails. We had another one who told us we basically had it done, and then started getting a bit weird on the emails, and then eventually, after weeks of, t of, of keeping us along, and in my naivety, I stopped talking to other publishers. That was my first fucking mistake, is that I should have kept talking to everyone else, but I was like, I don't know, loyal, like an idiot. And it strung us along. And by the end of that, my fucking spirit was totally broken. And then trying to get back on the horse, trying to go back and email people again. And then that publisher did it again. They were like, oh, actually, I think we're good now. And then like, again, it was, and that time I was like, you need to fucking tell us right now, yes or no. And then eventually I got a firm uh, no again. But it's, it's basically this whole section here is to just say that I, while I had empathy for developers before this about, what it must be like going through this and getting down on your fucking knees and asking people for uh, money that they're then going to give you a shitty deal and you're basically doing all the work. <laughs> um, I have even more empathy for them now. Um, there are great publishers out there. We talked to great people who were excited to fund us and it just didn't work out or it didn't feel like a good match or whatever. I, I'm in, I am not the type of person who signs contracts that don't feel like everyone is going in the right direction because we need that momentum and we need positivity and we need help. Um, so I wasn't going to sign some some sort of wet deal. Uh, but yes, I have massive empathy for anyone trying to get money in this industry, especially now. All right, let's talk to Alex. Hi, Alex Austin. Hi, should Daniel we, Dwyer. Should we, should we talk about publishers? Yeah. Aren't they that's, great? That's fun. <laughs> Fuck. I feel like I learned a lot about both uh, how hard it is to get people to sign a contract and also my sort of my own, the limits of my own chariz charisma uh, or ability to get people to stick the fucking landing. Um, yeah, yeah, it's been a wild well, year. We picked the worst year, I think, to try and find a publisher. That is also, that was slowly dawning on me yeah. as the year went on, is that everyone else I was talking to in the indie space was like, oh yeah, money's getting so tight. And, yeah. then, and then you sort of saw it catch up with the rest, like big studios were kind of next then. Like it was like, the indie stuff was like the canary in the coal mine for what was coming. Now we've had 
all these layoffs and it's just like a weird time to be asking people for money. You know, it seemed like a couple times we had a deal. So it's like, okay, we can, we can do this. And then it falls through. It's like, oh shit, how am I gonna pay rent? You're right, how yeah. How am I gonna pay taxes? It happened twice yeah. where we had somebody, and maybe this is my own like naivety or lack of experience, but both times we were like, it was like, it was like online dating. Once I was like having a conversation with somebody that felt like, oh, we're actually gonna do this, I like stopped talking to other people, yeah. which that was my first fucking mistake. I should have like kept going down the road. Um, I had it in my head that I was like, oh, I'm gonna negotiate hard. I'm gonna like have, I know your worth. I know like the worth of this project. I know what it needs. So I'm not gonna go for any like silly offers basically. And it meant that some of our negotiating was like, long because it was a lot of back and forth and figuring stuff out but we had one publisher who kind of on two separate occasions said they were down for it like which was particularly annoying and a lot of like people not responding to emails and like just the weirdest shit that like i'm just not used to yeah yeah the ghosting is pretty frustrating and then the second one we had straight up ghosted us yeah. Like they were like, we're going to do it. We're going to sign the contract. We're, you know, this is great. We had multiple meetings with all of their people and then just stopped replying to fucking emails. Yeah. Like, what? I mean, I kind of wonder, do you know if anybody got laid off there or something? Or maybe they don't. But then we had publishers like, I don't know if I want to say the names of like the good ones, but like, I'll just say it and I can edit it out later. But Nigel at Devolver was very fucking upfront about it. Yeah. He was like, we might be interested in this. Obviously he... They published Sub Rosa, or they helped you a bit with that. Um, and he was like, I'm gonna to talk to them about it. And then like a week later, he was like, not sure, because like we have a pretty full slate. We've had some stuff in 23 that's been pushed to 24. Uh, and then a week later, he was like, no, it's not gonna happen. And it was like, cool, Yeah. thanks. Thanks for letting us know. Thanks for trying it out. And then not wasting our time, I guess. Yeah. Like we had some publishers who they were talking to us were like, okay, this could be like, an, like a sort of a, live game yeah where we can like add skins in and we can you know like that's because like the 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 investment we were looking for wasn't even all that much but like it's not really worth the energy on their side for some of them if they're not going to get like a 5x return or a 10x return or yeah you know a 20x return so yeah like i'm not going to lie and say that we're going to do a live service thing because i'm i'm not going to make a live service game right and it, i think those are finally starting to like people are realizing like people don't want a second job right. for a game, right? Another thing you saw last year is just games, like people making a game and selling it and like that working really well. Which but I, I think part of the appeal with that is like you can host your own servers and stuff in Power World, right? Right. And, and Lethal Company, I think, is peer-to-peer -peer mostly, yeah. like Stunt Derby is, yeah. And people miss that, you know, just being able to play with their friends, like not having to play with strangers all the time. Yeah, not and, having to uh, go into a, like matchmaking, lobbying, yeah. all that sort of stuff. Like there does seem to be, and in fairness, you said this a long time ago to me, that there is these, and it makes sense with the games you've been making over the years. You know what I mean? Like these groups of people who want to play these games over and over. And Sun Derby is a game you can play, and we did play yeah. over and over <laughs> and over again. Um, but yeah, there are obviously this year it's been proven out that a lot of people are happy to have their like, They've got their like four, five, six buddies they play with all the time and they need a new game to like yeah. go in there. Yeah. But I'm with you. I it was honestly like the first six months of twenty twenty three, it was almost like the game was in early access. Because we were doing yeah. like weekly play tests at least and updates were coming every single week. But I hear what you're saying. But I think I was too focused on like, okay, this mode's super fun, how can we like perfect it? Right. Um and I think one thing we need to do is make some single player stuff. It already is kind of fun, like there's um, Fail Race did the stream, uh, did yeah, the yeah, video, yeah. Thank and you, he Fail had Race. a lot of fun, like just making tracks with a hundred AI players. Just throwing the AI in, yeah, um, yeah. And the AI doesn't like that's one thing I'm definitely going to fix up so it can drive around more tracks <laughs> than, <laughs> and not just go flying off all the time. Not having some more stuff like that for the demo because mm. it's hard to rely on people having like ten friends ready to play yeah. a game. Totally, and we um, also did a lot of work to get it. You know, you did loads of work to get the Next Fest demo up. Yeah, just finishing any game for any sort of public consumption is right. like weeks of work. And so, yeah, like I didn't have time to fix. Uh, I wanted to fix the AI. I had like a huge list notepad <laughs> that I wanted to fix. But you know, you get to that last week, and it's like, oh, there's this, this bug, this bug, this bug. It's like, and you just... don't want to fuck with it then 
Because you could break everything as well. <laughs> like you could do some. It's like yeah, you don't want to do any major changes. But I mean, you're not even thinking about that at that point. Right. Like, yeah. I think the graphics could definitely be improved, but mm -hmm. like that's something. You know, we need an artist to help yeah. out with that. Like if we're really going to overhaul the graphics. Right? Yeah. It's so. either going to cost like nothing. Or like this much. Yeah. It's like there's no like mid like there's a few <laughs> things I can still do. Like I haven't put the clouds in and like some more trees and stuff like that. Dust you're saying I can do, smoke yeah. and things like that. Yeah. But I think the main thing that I've been thinking about that's missing is kind of like something that, stuff that appeals to like a ten year old. Okay. You know, so like that's like we've been talking about, How about the, this? the rockets. Have you heard of Pokemon? <laughs> no. If Pal World can do it, why can't we? Yeah. Now what do you Capture think? Card. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, like rockets. Okay, yes. Rockets Absolutely. Fun. Yeah. Uh, like the grappling hook. The grappling hook has and been, like, yeah. You've done a bunch of this stuff behind closed doors too. Yeah, also I've had been your, working on some of this yeah, and already. The capture the trailer mode. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, jump jets, I think would be another fun one. So just having some like, kind of like crazy stuff like that. Having a few more cars. We only have three cars. Right. Uh, what type of cars did you put in? If you had your like top three Cars, well, I definitely want, want to put, put in, in like F1 style open wheel car. Get in. Um, like a bus, I think would be fun. Right. But even in the team mode, I think like just being able to <laughs> literally park like the a bus. Full side. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. The other team. Jose Mourinho style. Uh, yeah. But like if you can figure out ways of other people can contribute to the team mm. without being the best player. And that's the fun thing with team mode already. Yeah. You don't have to be the best driver to contribute. You no, know, like the, the van. The people, best driver might get hit by a van, yeah. and like you have to take over. And you know, we get this thing funded, we get it in early access. What's the end goal of Stunt Derby? Because we've already said like making a live service game isn't really like there will be a 1.0 version, and that's yeah. the game, right? And like people can just do with it what they want, play with their friends, make their own tracks, fucking tear the code apart. I don't know, do whatever you want, kind of thing, right? Yeah, I. Like, I think that's another thing where it's kind of fluid. Like, I don't, I don't know exactly what 1.0 is. Like, right. we have to see what people like, you know? Like, there's a lot of different mode ideas that we've been talking about, like the soccer mode, you know, the, the trailer, capture the trailer modes. And um, I kind of just want to see what, what people like, what mm. people react to. And um, eventually I would like to have it so people can make their own modes, you know, have some sort of scripting thing. Right. Um, Pokemon mode, PAL mode, <laughs> get it. I'm just trying to hop on the trends, man, okay? I'm the producer. Let's get some we're PALs all, in this game. We're lethal company, right? Oh, yeah. Exactly. Got some great advice that I should make Sub Rosa more like lethal company. Is that what somebody said? <laughs> I mean, basically. <laughs> Look how successful that game was. Why don't you just do that? Just do that. <laughs> just make a great game everyone plays. Yeah. So, what's the future for Stunt Derby? Myself and Alex think it, the game is too early for early access. He needs like two or three months to get it to a position where we feel confident putting it up there. Early access games on Steam now are of like a pretty decent quality and he needs some time to work on it, like dedicated. Uh, and we do need an artist to come in and help us out with some of that stuff and clean up the UI and get some new cars in there and just make the game feel like an intentional retro game rather than programming art. Respect to Alex, I love his programming art, but I think, I think there's a look there that we'd like to aim for. Um, and short of getting initial investment from a fund or from a publisher, I don't know what the option is. Aside from me throwing more of my, my cash at it, it might be Kickstarter. I, I don't know. Do people still use Kickstarter? <laughs> I have some things I funded 10 years ago. I'm still waiting to get the fucking, uh, I'm still checking my mailbox for it. Um, so I don't know. I mean, the game is playable. We play it every week. It's lots of fun. We could just sell access to it like that. We've been giving beta keys to patrons for over a year now and they've been enjoying it. Um, I think that's probably the most pragmatic way around it, but Honestly, I'm going to wait until after GDC before we make any final decisions because who knows? Who knows what can happen? I'm an eternal optimist. This whole... I wouldn't have start... I don't think anyone makes a game or starts making a game unless they are some sort of an optimist. Because the more I get, you know, into this whole process and the more I learn about it, which is the whole point of this series, um, 
the more I realize how impossible it is that any game comes out. But Stunt Derby will come out. That's the one thing I'm determined about. So don't worry, we're not going anywhere. Until next time, it won't be a year until we post the next video, I promise. We'll see you then. Good stuff. All right, buy Stunt Derby today. Fund it today. Do the thumbs, Alex. There we go.